Welcome to the journey of an aesthete, a comprehensive examination of all things aesthetic, the arts, the humanities, and what it means to be human. Hi Shapiro there. Hi, Nick. Anna, it's such a great honor to, to talk with you on our show. Welcome to Journey of an Aesthete podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you um, invite me onto your show. I'm so excited. Yeah, I mean, my show is, uh, there's so much to talk about. And I, you know, of course, I'm very respectful of the guest time. And, and you'll have to keep me informed in, in terms of uh, how much time you have. But um, I, I should say, you know, I, I've had so many different kinds of guests on our show. Um, you're unusual in a couple respects, because I think I might know you better than any guest I've had since we dated Back back in 2002, 2003, we, we were in a relationship. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. Over a decade ago, it is amazing. Back in Boston. Back at, well, for you, see, that's an interesting thing. You bring up Boston because for me, thinking about that time, I, I have very fond memories of that, actually. And the thing, the first thing that comes to mind is it's much more than Boston because you were interested in towns surrounding Boston, right? You had interest in Providence, you had interest in Maine. You were doing history of Somerville, and again, I don't want to get ahead of, our, ahead of myself, but um, it seems like you're very much a, a similar artist now as you were then, exploring. Um, well, I'd rather hear you talk about it, but I think you're, you're unique in your artistry because you're trying to, I think, find a balance between uh, relevant art and public art, ecology, geography, but also sculpture and paint, and 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 you've been pursuing this project, I think, for now what twenty years, the twenty five, thirty years. Yeah, maybe even 30 years. I mean, I've been an artist since I was a little girl. Um, and I actually, it's funny that you talk about all my explorations. Um, there was something that was missing. And I, the reason why I mentioned it is I just brought up this um, box for my basement. It's a Singer Featherweight sewing machine. It's an antique, wow. probably from my great aunt Betty. Wow. And um and so, you know, I feel like I'm in many different places. She was from Brooklyn. Well, actually, originally from Ukraine, Russia, uh, Odessa. <laughs> so place is really important. Process is really important. Uh, yeah. Connecting to, to, to people is really important to me. All those things still. You, you and I have an interesting amount of things in common because aren't we both ex-New Yorkers or, or you were you originally in New York? Yeah, I was born in New York City I was and I lived at, there for 18 years. Yeah, New York City, 1967 here. Um, so we, we're both displaced, I uh, guess, New Yorkers. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, you know, I always have the best connections with New Yorkers. Yeah, it's a, it's a really beautiful place. It's a it's a symbol to me. Uh, New York's very much a symbol of, um, you know, I guess the imagined possibility of unity um, and and sort of of all peoples, and you know, it's the Statue of Liberty and, it, and it's all that. So there's right. there's a lot to that aspect of New York, acknowledging, of course, all of its downsides and all the economic inequality and hardships and everything, of course, but. Yeah. Anyhow, but anyhow, I wanted to get back to you because usually on my show, what we do is what I call a linear chronology. And mm -hmm. so the very thing I do want to talk about is, is you as a child, a little girl, a teenager, an adult woman, basically how you came to become the kind of artist you are and do this very, I should say, very unique work involving craft and involving uh, your newest work, involving public places, or just talk about your your, your story mm. in terms of how you came to do those things. Because at the time that you and I were dating, I remember very clearly you gave me a book by Ann Carson. Oh, autobiography. I love her. Uh, yeah, Autobiography of Red. Yeah. I gave you a Bessie Johnson dress. I won't ask if you still own it. Remember that <laughs> Bessie Johnson dress? Yes, I do. <laughs> I won't tell you if I still own it or not. Right, I'm right, sure right. I don't fit into it anymore. Well, that's it was pink with little uh, beaded tassel fringe at the bottom. That's fantastic. I mean, and, and of that's course, you, you have yeah. a partner now, and you're also a mom. You've done so yes. many things, and I guess the thing that's I don't want to get too um, overwhelmed or too. I just want to take things a step at a time. So, do you mind going back and talking about your first, you know, feet into what we call art or making things, wherever you wherever you want to begin? Sure. Um, well, I always love talking with you, Mitch, and I always get a little nervous because you're so smart. And um, so in preparation for this, I reread my bio, and there's a word in there that is really directly responsive to your question. Um, that is the word distaff. 
It's kind of an old fashioned word. It is. And it means from the mother's side. Oh, okay. And um, I would say that my mother, who is a dancer and a choreographer and teaches uh, movement analysis, Laban notation, she's always been interested in the connection between movement and visual art. And um, she always brought me to all kinds of museums and galleries and exhibits and dance and concerts and things in New York because, of course, everything is available. And this was New York in the 70s, so really everything was going on at that time. John Cage. It's a very dangerous thing on my podcast to mention New York in the 70s. Uh, very dangerous to have me. This is your show. I do not want to hijack the show because you know I would be. We I would be here at noon. I would be here in the morning talking about the cool thing you said. But yeah, go ahead. Start. Well, you know, clearly that means that it's been too long since we've had a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so to to bring it out of that time frame, but to bring it back to um, the the um, matriarchs of my family, I would say that. You know, it wasn't just my mother, um, but it was her mother who sewed all of my mother's clothes for a long time. My grandmother, Nana Hilda, um, loved fashion. Right. And um, when my grandfather was in school, they didn't have a lot of money, and they, uh, she made my mother and her sister all their clothes. So sewing has always been in the family. And then on my father's side, his mother, uh, my, my um, grandma May, she was a milliner. She made hats. Um, and my great aunt Betty, who was my um, paternal grandfather's sister, she worked for Singer Sewing Company. So um, that kind of making or hands on has been in my family. My great grandfather, Nathan from Odessa, he was a watchmaker. So there was always a hands on element and a, and a fine craftsmanship that I think runs through the family. Um, Mm -hmm. My paternal grandfather was a film projectionist in Brooklyn. Um, So there's a visual appreciation. I think he was probably um, uh, an artist at heart, but couldn't be one because of his responsibilities to the family during the the Depression and all. Um, So so, do you mind if I hold that thought? Because I have, of course, additional questions. So you're connected... You know, one of my favorite books, of course, stories is Tell Me a Riddle by Tilly Olson. Well, I don't want mm-hmm. to get, I don't want to get further ahead, but, but you know, New York, you know, the, the New York Jewish diaspora and the, the culture and history that is so important to me. And that's one of my hobbies and one of my interests is, is all the, you know, I, I love Stanley Elkin and, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot to that. So would you say mm-hmm. that your artwork is influenced much by sort of the, the history of fashion in New York and the immigration experience as much as, you know, you mentioned uh, the projectionist movie theaters and I don't know, I don't want to speak too much, but you, you go. Ahead. Well, you know, it's all of it. I don't think that I could separate any one thing out. You know, you talk about how complicated and intricate and, um, and, and uh, exploratory my life was, was, is, will be. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really kind of I mean the tech I guess the textile is a great analogy because yeah. there's so many elements to weave together um, and there's the past there's you know the generations in the past um, that have an incredible amount of import whether it's mm-hmm. you know through genetics from my genetic awareness or from my awareness of the history yeah. or from just the air <laughs> that's yeah. there I mean fashion in New York and textiles kind of all go hand in hand for the last you know, for the 20th century anyway. Um, so, so you were, so yeah. I guess, I guess, so I guess you're saying when you were a, a young artist, I, I, I was, I guess, you know, these are things I actually, at the time back when I knew you very well, I only know a little bit of it. I actually wish we had talked more about these things or had opportunity. Cause I, you know, I didn't really, um, you know, of course I was 20, 2002, 2003. And so, you know, but now it's still here because you're, you say you're investigating as we, as we speak, um, clothes that are left over, right. Or wardrobes or things. And, and the, so, so in terms of your yeah. ancestors, so, so what are some of the things that you remember your, 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 uh, relatives making just to name, uh, just anything off the, off the, off the top of your consciousness. Like I remember this, well, this, this dress or this. You- 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, life is such a spiral. You know, you keep kind of coming back to themes over and over again from different perspectives um, and see them differently. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here with my great Aunt Betty sewing machine and I have a, a form of a, a, um, a dress form, yeah. actually not from a family, but from a um, from a friend, boyfriend who uh, was a window dress designer and oh, I have wow. clothes on it, old clothes on it from yard sales and dollar a bag sales and I have a typewriter in front of me and then next to me I'm working on a quilt um, that is sort of a family history for my parents' 50th anniversary oh. and that has a whole element to it. So oh, like do I remember one thing? I mean I remember sitting at the sewing machine with my mother making Halloween costumes. Yeah. Um, from when I was a little girl right. and, um, and I remember making clothes with her and I remember my grandmother's sewing station. It was just in a hallway in her house. Yeah. Um, I never actually saw her sew because at that point I don't think she really did anymore. Right. Um, and I didn't ever remember seeing my grandma May making hats, but it's all that oral history that yeah. has sort of informed yeah. my awareness of my family. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating to me. I mean, I think that the, well, in a way, do you see, uh, again, I don't want to get too far ahead because I want to st stick with the, you know, the so-called linear, as I always say, the linear things make the non-linear things happen. <laughs> it's just, well, yeah, it's just, it's, it's all non-linear. He's just <laughs> pretending to make it linear. <laughs> no, no, no. I want the linear to be, it's sort of a foundation, but it's not real. I mean, what's, what's, you know, metaphysically, spiritually real, of course, is completely non-linear and completely. Right. Well, right, right. we'll just yeah. hyperlink through this conversation. <laughs> just like, you know, to, so we, so we had to plan where well, I'm going to call you at a certain time. We're going to do the show. That's yeah. the mechanics. But the, the aim, of course, is to have that as a bedrock. So then we can get wild and go into something or get something, <laughs> something a little de a little deeper, a little more serious. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, fa the world of fashion, what comes to your mind when you think about the history of the garment district in New York and fashion or anything else or, or, or just... Mm. Oh, my God. Yeah. So fabulous. I mean, yeah, we I guess we never really got into talking about New York garment fashion. I mean, I always knew you to be a, an incredibly well-dressed man. Yeah. And at the time that you know me, I was wearing polyester pants and a button-down polyester shirt, you know? I liked it. <laughs> that was not so fashionable, I know, because it made you think of the 70s. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I think about fashion in New York, I think about the Met. The Metropolitan okay. Museum of Art, sure. Fashion, or Costume Institute, um, which is an interesting place in a lot of ways. I just found out that it's the only self-funded aspect of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's right. Uh, and the big Met Gala is all about that, and that's why people just go all out with it. But I, I mean, Anna, did, did, that was, I hope I hope you liked AOC's dress. You know, I don't even recall what it was. So AOC made headlines, made international headlines with the dress she wore at the Met Gala. I think it was last year. Yeah. Years ago. And it was, this year. It was probably this year because it was rescheduled because of COVID, of course. That's right. So it was, um, anyhow, it said Eat the Rich on it, I think. And it was. It, oh, yeah. I heard about it. I don't think I saw it. Or maybe I did, but it's not sticking. Well, she looked, she ashamed looked, to say. looked amazing in it. I mean, well, well that's a whole. I mean, I again, I, I'm always sympathetic to blending, you know, beauty and social justice or aesthetics. And yeah. I don't, I don't think that there's a natural, I don't think that there's a natural en enmity between them. I think that's just artificially created. We assume they have to be separate, or we assume that they can't go together. Oh, fashion is so political. I mean, it, it tells you, it, it shows. I mean, fashion. It's like the signifiers of who you are, where you're from, how much money you have, what style you are. I mean, right. even now, it's probably one of the strongest signifiers of, of who you are, you know, yeah. whether it's a plaid shirt or right, right. or a high fashion dress that says eat the rich or what, secondhand clothing. I mean, the resurgence of secondhand clothing now is phenomenal and, is. Um, you know, socially conscious clothing That's and right. fast That's fashion right. and people getting into... May, what, Made by Me May? Have you heard about that? A little bit. I mean, again, I, it's hard to keep up with everything. But as you know, I've always I know. been, I've always, been um, I've always bought used clothing and vintage clothing as, as well as bespoke. bespoke. 
Yeah. I've always done both, which is kind of unusual, right? So I've always been interested, yeah. of course, in slow fashion. All yeah. my fashion is slow fashion, not fast fashion, but, but, but yeah. But, but yeah. Well, that's one of the things that is really fantastic about you, Mitch, you know, is that aesthetic that you have around fashion and clothing and attire and self-presentation. It's, it's your art. It's one of your many arts. It, it is. And I, and I saw it, but it's, it's exciting to hear that you have a direct link to that history. And, and it's, um, and I, yeah, well, you know, yeah. there's a book, um, that you're reminding me, I wanted to mention, I can't remember the name, but it's about that, uh, 1911 fire that happened in the, um, shirtwaist? garment district. Yeah. The in the shirtwaist house. And it was, the, yeah, the yeah. shirtwaist. Yeah. Um, and it was fiction about a carnival, um, um, like a Carney family yeah. and um, a fellow who kind of escapes that and winds up um, becoming, um, he live, He becomes a photographer. Oh, wow. And he photographs that. And um, it, it's sort of like about Manhattan mm. in that time of transition yep. from kind of farmland and mansions and, uh, you know, the Hudson River and factories and kind of where it starts to transition into apartment buildings and uh, all of that. I mean, it's, it's, it's so fascinating. And I think I went to the garment district probably for the first time when I was a teenager. And I was, right. you know, there's the garment district, there's That's the right. diamond district, there's the leather district, right. there's the Lower East Side, which is just rich with so much. Right. And it's, it's fascinating. Then here I am in Providence now, which is where you know, Pawtucket, Slater Mill, is the first um, industrial <clears throat> textile mill in America. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Samuel Slater actually, um, uh, he, um, he, he stole the intellectual property by his memory of, from an, from a mill in England, from a textile mill in England. And he memorized it and he rebuilt it in Pawtucket. He rebuilt it in, in Rhode Island, right? In, uh... Yeah. In Rhode Island. And, uh, and, you know, that Rhode Island is rich with the textile sure. history. Well, of course, as you know, RISD always had a great fashion department and always had a, that's a whole other, yeah. other discussion. Yeah. They're no, they're actually, yeah. well, I mean, only really more insiders know about that. I mean, of course you, did you, 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 I don't want to get too far ahead, but you have a Chicago connection too, but we can get, we can get, mm-hmm. so, so you're yes. developing. So I guess my next question is when did you start making work that you considered sort of art by which I mean, something that's made for reflection and not completely utilitarian mm. aesthetic. I mean, I know that you started doing that, but what, what, when did you, when would you say you became aware that that was a project or something you were, you were, you were serious about or you, would you say? Well, because of my mother's encouragement and because of her interest in the art, I was I was always making art in a certain way. Um, I probably wasn't self-aware as an artist at three, making this wonderful watercolor of squiggly lines and stuff, but there's definitely, you know, something wonderful and magical that happens with three-year-olds that are given watercolor paint. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and then, you know, as a teenage girl, I loved Erte and oh, his fashion design and Art Deco. And yeah. at the time, down in Soho, there were lots of poster exhibits of Erte, and there was, like, yeah. an Erte show at the Costume Institute. Mm. Um, and that whole time of the twenties fascinated me because of the liberation from oh, the yeah. restrictive form of, you know, corsets and oh, yeah. proper dress. Right. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, so, so I was always kind of creative and thought maybe I'd be a fashion designer or maybe I would work in a museum or something. And then I did go, you know, I studied with, um, uh, a, a woman who was a painter in Long Island City, she gave me lessons in painting on oh, Saturdays. On Saturday. I would take the number seven train out there. That's and uh, Irene, yeah, it was okay. great. Um, and that's probably when I started looking in a different way, uh, you know, maybe from when I was 16. Sure, sure. Um, I had been, my school had a really great art teacher and every other year she would take a trip a two week trip in the summer to Italy and she would bring students with her to study. And I was supposed to go. 
Uh, and then there was like some kind of terrorism that happened in Italy. Oh, the and brigades. Probably the Red Brigade, brigade I would imagine. It, it, it was like 1986 or 86. There was still, uh, there was still an ex- a very bad extremist Marxist-Leninist uh, terrorism in Italy still. Mm-hmm. Uh, at that time, of course, unfortunately, it was also a resurgence of fa- fascist terrorism. But, but um, I don't know which one. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. What, but but anyway, go, go ahead. Yeah, it would be interesting to know. I mean, just yeah. that in that in that timeline and markers in life, and yeah. this is something I don't really talk about with anybody. But you've certainly uh, opened a door in my memory that yeah. that's really kind of fun to explore. Um, so instead of going to Italy, because everybody was afraid that there would be another terrorist yeah. attack, uh, we went to Mexico. They had friends in Mexico, um, and we stayed in San Cristobal de las Casas, mm-hmm. uh, which is not far from Oaxaca. And um, I remember painting a parrot and it was just, I mean, I painted a lot of things. I painted the fountains and I was using acrylic paint and I had just this one brush that I loved and I used all these bright colors. And I think that's probably when I really started making art was there. When, the, when I, the, um, that was the time when you, you had a sense of a change in your consciousness or your, um, a shift in what your sense of purpose, I guess, or, or self-confidence. And the impact it had on other people. Ah, that's interesting. You mean like the audience or, or viewers? Yeah. Okay. I think that's when I became aware of the audience as a response. I mean, I, I, was, I was painting and I, I was creative, but I never really thought about the audience per se, other than like all those myths that you hear about, you know, when you go to artists' exhibits at museums sure. about, you know, the tormented artist or the strong artist or the artist <laughs> right, that's right. been supported by the artist's wife or, you know, all that stuff. You know, you hear all those myths and you get this idea of the mm-hmm. individual grand artist, you know, mm-hmm. Van Gogh or Michelangelo or yeah. Dustin Pollock and... Um, and Lee Krasner. Well, right, exactly. Or... Who is my favorite? Or of the t- Louise Nevelson, who left Louise her Nevelson family. Amazing. Um, right or Louis Bourgeois? I don't. Louis, well, both Louis Bourgeois. And, well, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't want to be too. I don't know if it's changed subject too much. But I, I was as a as a child, I went to a Louise Nevelson show. I think it was at the Whitney. That would have been like in the seventies, and it just knocked me out. I was just like, yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know. I I hadn't seen anything like that. Yeah, that was just incredible. Yeah, but yeah. I guess people are starting to talk about her again now more. Right? Is that is that true? I don't well, I mean, she's 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 in the canon for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, from Maine, she reused all this all this furniture parts and cut off the wood and painted everything yeah. black, and, and she was just an extraordinary individual. And yeah. Um, yeah, that that legacy of female sculpture is just, oh. is wonderful and something that I'm investigating a lot right now. Yeah. Um, in the vein of of um of those folks. Oh my. Yeah. yeah, well, of them, but also, um, oh, gosh. Judy Chicago. I get, I, well, there's yeah, definitely Judy Chicago, um, but I'm thinking, like, more contemporary installation like Jessica Stockholder or Doris Salcido, who is a, oh. a, a, a Colombian artist who I'm fascinated with right now. And, mm-hmm. um, but anyway, um, that's not really what the question was, but I forgot what I the question, I had a question was. Uh, I was just trying to get a sense of... Uh, and also, too, do you think it makes a difference? I'll ask you a related question. It sounds like you started more in painting before sculpture. Is that true? Or was oh, right. Yeah. Do you think that yeah. makes a difference in the artist you become that you went in that direction? I mean, not that it – maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. I, I'm an outsider, well, so I don't know. What, 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, you're the athlete. <laughs> well, you're the audience. You're the viewer. I'm an outsider in the sense that I can't draw for to save my life, and I don't have any <laughs> any of that stuff. So I'm, I I defer to your your yeah your, your perception because that's something I don't know about, and I don't know how many. Well, I love to paint. I mean, painting is like a foundation. Drawing and painting, and especially watercolor. I just love watercolor. It's so portable and so immediate, and it's also so quirky and challenging at the same time. It's it's this really finicky medium. Um, but what happened was that, you know, I started out as a painter mm-hmm. and I went to the university of Chicago to study art and art history. Wow. Um, and I got interested in, you know, you had to take foundation classes cause it was a foundation school. You took core classes for the first two years, even in art, you know, you had to take sculpture and, um, 
uh, stone carving and photography, not, you know, painting, drawing. And um, so I was there for a year and a quarter. Mm -hmm. They were on the quarter system. And then I transferred to the museum, uh, the School of the um, Art Institute of Chicago for another year, which was fantastic. And that's when I really got into watercolor. I studied with Gladys Nilsson, and she was fantastic. Um, And then I dropped out because I just thought Mm -hmm. that – Nobody could teach me art. Uh, <laughs> I see. Pretty arrogant. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I want to. I want to rewind a little bit because that's a lot to take in. Because you're in Chicago, and of course, th- those programs are really. To somebody who doesn't know what what made those pro- programs in Chicago so special and talked about all around the U.S. and the world, what were the the qualities? If you had to, if you had to, um, uh, off the top of your head, to mention those that you think. Just curious. curious. Well, the access to knowledge was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Just um, being at the University of Chicago, you know, you're on top of like the Fermi Lab, which is this theoretical physics super collider, basically, you know, or where they developed the nuclear bomb. Or, oh, yeah, and there's just right. so right. much brain power and, you, you know, conservative and liberal. And it was just like everything was there. There was yeah. so much brain power. Yeah. You could just absorb it. And uh, I remember me wandering around being curious and finding basements that were full of books. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, that was a fantastic place where you just the excitement for learning was encouraged, and you could just really explore anything. And yeah. I can't say that I was very good at any of it, huh. but I was interested in all of it. That's interesting. Now you say you can't say you were really good at any individual thing, but you were interested in all of it. Mm-hmm. So what I would say, uh, if I if I may be so bold, uh, is to say that if I, I believe that. An interest in all of it could create goodness. Uh, what I mean is that it could be a a, 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 um, a pathway to getting good at, at something or things, right? Do you think you think that's too optimistic? Or I sort of feel I feel that there's that there's that, right? Well, I guess it depends on on your nature. Okay. Um, because and and goodness is a funny word because it seems to add some kind of a value system to it. All right. Uh, but. For me and my personality, being interested in all of it is how I process it and how I understand it. I'm I'm curious in the connections between things as opposed to the precision of knowledge and expertise in one thing. I mean, you may or may not know. I don't I don't put much truck by even the word good. I mean, these are these, of course, are all problematic words. All all I mean is. um, well, you're saying it now. You, it's almost like you're you're synthesizing these things, right? And through mm-hmm. synthesizing them, that's how you develop your own style. Would that be another way of putting it, or or no? Yeah, mm-hmm. um, but I would also say that synthesizing these things is my style, that is and okay. aestheticizing it is my art. Okay, you know, okay. Um, and how I aestheticize it is my style. I see. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, I, I, I like that. Um, you know, it's funny. I just I, I'm looking at your brand new work, uh, this uh, dark macrame. This um, that's in your on your website. Oh, the videotape. Video. It's, cro- yeah. it's crocheted videotape. It's crocheted videotape. That's that in itself is amazing. Is that getting too far ahead? Do you want to weave in and out and? Go go to that. Oh, I'd be glad to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, well, that's. A, I remember Anna's bananas. That would have been. Remember Anna's bananas. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, now I go by Anna Banana. Anna Banana. Um, and, then, and then there's the Wave Lady. Um, do you? You're a Wave Lady, right? So. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about ecological concerns or natural concerns in your work? A little bit, because it seems to be a theme. Or do, is that is that want to wait? Put a hold on that later, or is this a time that you want to get into that? Or? Yeah, well, I think that um, nature is always going to be there for me. Um, I can't say that I'm getting very didactic about uh, the ecological disaster that we find ourselves in in the 21st century. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean that's been a concern of mine. You know, in addition to being an artist and a creator, I've always been an outdoors woman. Um, I'm really comfortable around a campfire. I'm really comfortable 
uh, in the wilderness for extended periods of time, maybe less so now because I haven't done it in a while, but, um, but I real, I, I'm very aware of nature and, um, I've been a park ranger and I've done tree identification you, walks and uh, you, I'm an urban gardener and all I mean, that's like sort of the other hold, side I mean, what? You were a park park ranger. When was that? You didn't? No. How could you not know that? I don't know. That's my own <laughs> ignorance. And where, where were you a park ranger? Um, I was a park ranger at Acadia National Park. I'll be darned. In Maine, on Mount okay. Desert Island in Maine, Bar Harbor. That's beautiful. Yeah, it was wonderful. And then I was sort of a, a park ranger apprentice in Utah at Canyonland. Wow. I'm yeah, which is the quintessential I'm... environmentalist location. I don't know if you ever read The Monkey Wrench Gang. I ha- of course I read that. Yeah, would that be? It, well, a lot of people these days have not. And I, it's, it should really be something everybody reads in high school. Um, you think I should be teaching Edward Abbey in high school? That's interesting. That's interesting. Don't you? You'll get a lot of, you'll get, well, I don't, I don't share. I'm not, um, well, I mean, as a, as a, as a work of literature or as a. Yeah. Or as a, as a, as a philosophical uh, notion. Um, I, I mean, we teach John Updike, we teach the jungle. Upton Sinclair, right? Well, actually, I think I think um, that's a great book. I'm just trying to remember. You know, I think at Interlock, and we read that. I think we read the Monkey Rich Gang, and I think we read that at the same time as we read Ken Kesey. I think, or, or um, uh huh. So yeah, yeah. I do you know the book? But is that I, I'm getting too far ahead? But you were that was instrumental to what you were. Well, okay. So I was I was in Utah studying, learning how to be a park ranger, and I was in this a section called the Maze District of Canyonlands, which is like I don't know an hour on a dirt road outside of a town called Green River Junction, right. which is the melon capital of the world, apparently, or yeah. so they claim. And um, and so you're just going deeper and deeper into this. Um, sort of sagebrush, right, cattle ranching territory. And then you find yourself in the National Park, which is like this um, series of canyons that um, that the um, Anasazi lived in. That's right. And, uh, and it's the beginning. It's sort of like the headwaters of the Grand Canyon. Mm-hmm. And it's where Hey Duke, if you remember in the Monkey Wrench Gang, like they do all of their monkey wrenching and all their eco-terrorism, and then he wanders off into the desert, into that's, the maze. That's right. And that's where he goes, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So I loved being there for that reason, amongst other reasons. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's an amazing place. So I, I would imagine being a park ranger is a pretty demanding a calling or a job or occupation, whatever you want to call it. And so uh, how were you able to do that and do all these other projects? So did you alternate them or did you, or how did, how did, well, um, there's lots of different ways to be a park ranger. Um, there's law enforcement, which I did not do. uh Um, there's the interpretive, um, which is what I did, you know, explaining the landscape to visitors. Uh, and then there's the administrative, uh, and then there's also the biological, ecological, geological, you know, scientific aspect of being a park ranger, which I didn't do either. Um, but I did study geology. Wow. And that was where my career took me was to be a park ranger because I didn't want to be a miner and I didn't want to be an oil driller and I didn't want to be a hydrogeologist. So right. um, so I went into the park ranger service and and it's so visual and it, and being out in nature is inspiring to me. Sure. Um, so I, I guess it's a, I guess there's a direct relationship between your sculpture and that, right? So there's a, um, I'm sure that I'm sure your work as a park ranger was starting to then influence your work, right? Artistic, work, yeah, this, yeah. I did a lot of watercolors when I was a park ranger. Okay. Um, and I actually went after. So after I dropped out of the University of Chicago and the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago, I went back and studied geology. And I got my degree in with the park ranger. And then I um, and then I went back to school to get my MFA in, in Portland, Maine. Okay. And I was living in Somerville. It was a low residency program. And um, I was studying with some really amazing artists. Mm-hmm. And that's when I became a sculptor was in the MFA program. Interesting. So it's almost like a new, a new art medium develops at a certain time. You're doing these things and then you... You, uh, you, as you, as you, as you, as you grow, you, you develop, you, 
So that so the sculpture did cut happen later, I guess, is what you're saying. And that at that it, particular it did, and I think part of it was what I was exposed to. Okay. Um, because I'd always, you know, I'd seen sculpture, but I never really thought about how it was made. I just appreciated it. And I'd seen paintings and I always thought about how they were made. Um, and then I was exposed to installation art and I was exposed to um, critical thinking and critical theory. Um, you know, this was in the late 90s. So there was a lot of critical theory going around That's right. That's about, you know, right. art and every, about everything. Yeah. yeah. You know, sort of Freudian, Lacanian, uh-huh. um, um, the, the um, psychological aspects, you know, postmodernism. Right. Really. And, um, and so the idea of the MFA mm-hmm. was to knock you off your center, knock you out of your zone of comfort and get you making in a new way. I see, yeah. Uh, and give you sort of the philosophy and the theory behind what you're doing to really give it some neediness. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got really into installation and performance art. Mm-hmm. And went that way, and and that's probably right around when we met. That's right. That's right. And that um, I guess that's where we, we used to go to Oni Gallery and with the Eccles and all that. Yeah, exactly. Years, yeah. Yep. And then there was a uh, what was the gallery name in Somerville? I made an installation, a kinetic installation that uh, was about water splatting and somebody pulled on it and there was a jar full of glitter and it splattered all over the yep. floor. And it was sort of like this great moment. It was <laughs> Gallery a, Rashad. It was an unanticipated, but, but, but was it a usable moment or was it a workable moment? What was that? Was it, it was a workable moment. I mean, it was definitely was not how I intended it, but it made total sense. You know, the other- you know people always want to touch your artwork. It's so easy they're like oh let me you make tactile art people want to touch it of course yeah especially if it has glitter right or if it has texture or <laughs> something like that certainly. But, um, but i remember you did a project with, you did a project with firefighters didn't you wasn't there or or um do you remember that the latter uh the summer it's connected to your somerville project um with firefighters yeah firemen or fire or um Remember there was a ladder and it was, it was, I think it was part of your summer project and there were a lot of, there were a lot of parts to that. And maybe I missed. Oh, you're talking about the wave, the wave project. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where wave lady started. So I did, okay. I, Somerville had this windows art project. Um, they called it WAP. I don't know if they still do it or not. Um, but the Somerville Arts Council does amazing things. They're really strong. And, um, and I had the Somerville theater as my venue. Mm hmm. And um, this was a performance piece, an interactive performance piece. And I went to film um, the water around uh, the airport, around Logan Airport. Um, oh, wow. Was it, is it called Orient Point out there? Um, I do not know. I can't remember the, geog- the, the name of the geography, but I took some video of waves. And then I, I took a still from the video. And I printed it, and I photocopied it, and I mounted it on canvas, and I folded it up and put it in my pocket. And then I walked around Somerville, um, and I think the mayor was Mayor Day at the time. I went to her office. I went to firemen. I I just walked around Somerville and kind of asked people boldly, like, hey, I'm doing this art project. Are you interested? Would you like to participate? And if they were interested, I'd hand them this folded up object and they'd that. open it up That's right. and look at it and kind of look at me and we'd have a conversation about it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I'd take a picture of them holding the wave. And then that became a sequence, sort of like a grid mm-hmm. of w- people holding a picture of the wave so that it had a grid on it because it was folded up in my pocket. And then it was paired with an image of this wave. And then that turned into kind of like a filmic grid. It wasn't like an even mm-hmm. square grid because it was, you know, four by five kind of um, ratio. Mm -hmm. And that went into one window. It must have been, I don't know, 60 or more images of people holding this wave. And then there was um, mylar waving, you know, in the breeze that would reflect the light that was kind of like the experience of the wave. And then there was another picture of it. So that was in the three windows at the Somerville Theater. That must have been in 2000. Or maybe it was 1999. 
everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Yeah. So I guess in, the, in those years you were really developing your, I guess, continuing to develop your own style. And I guess um, I should ask you about this. It seems to me that you were pretty um, interested in, in doing things that involve, uh, I should say, things in the world. Mm-hmm. Art in the yeah. world. And it's funny, I recently had uh, Blake Gopnik, who did the Warhol biography on my show. Mm-hmm. And he had some very interesting ideas. But the one thing that we, the one thing that I didn't get a chance to get into it with him, but I did talk about it in my own video stream it, with reference to Warhol, is what I thought Warhol's contribution was. Was it actually bringing the world back in to the art world in a way, or bringing, taking the world seriously, right? Interestingly enough, because, you know, Warhol was always seen, of course, as frivolous and not serious sometimes, unfortunately. But um, I, I see you very much at that time beginning to bring the world in. Mm-hmm. When I say the world, I mean worldly things. Um, the, the, the maintenance of our life support, you know, biosphere, ecology, but also mm-hmm. those folks that you meet, like firefighters or um, people holding away, you know. So, so do you want mind talking a little bit about your thoughts about bringing the world in to your artwork, rather than you know closing your eyes to the world or you know or, or ignoring it, right? Or um, um, yeah, well, I think that um, you know Andy Warhol got labeled you know father of pop mm-hmm. art or a quintessential pop artist, and he was reflecting the world to the world. Oh, yeah. In a way. Um, and I do that in a different way. Of course. Yeah. You know, um, it's more of an activist approach, mm-hmm. um, using artwork to open up a perception of the world around us in a different way. So like with the wave. And some people just thought I was a little bit odd, but other people were like, oh, wow, you know, this is really interesting. And people started calling me the wave lady, which is kind of how I got that. That's how you got, you know, that. that's how I got that. Oh, you're the wave lady. Like, so, oh, yeah, I guess I am. This was, not something, <laughs> this was not something you engineered. It was something someone else put on you or something. Yeah, it just kind of happened. It's like any great nickname. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think... There's um, a level of engagement and community mindedness that's really important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first moved to Somerville, I don't know, it must have been like 1991. Oh, wow. Or 92. So you had been there um, before we met, and you'd been there a good 15 years. It sounds like you were. Yeah. Uh, and I moved away uh, and then moved back. Oh, okay. Uh, I moved away to be a park ranger and then came back. Um, wow. I, I'm, again, I can't get over. I feel like we should do a whole episode just, <laughs> just <laughs> you being a park ranger. Because, <laughs> no, no, because I, cause to me, that's, um, I mean, if a person comes on my show and they say to me, I've had coal miners on my show. I've had, um, I've had ministers on my show and actresses and, and actors. And, and so to me, someone saying they've been a park ranger, that's, that deserves its own episode. That's a, <laughs> it's like a zinger, you know. Uh, the outfit is great. <laughs> well, I mean, I just uh, um, I, I may ask one more question about that. So, did you, during your period as a park ranger, were you gaining insight into things that you would not have known without the experience of being a park ranger? Were you getting, I don't know, absolutely, yeah. Talk a little bit about what you were learning or what you were, how, how it changed your perception of things, if you don't mind, a few minutes or just because it interests. Yeah. Well, gosh, I mean, there's the, there's the content that's a phenomenal, um, and then there's the formal qualities of being a park ranger because you're a representative of the federal government. Oh, okay. Um, so those are really interesting, both very interesting um, aspects because the park service, the National Park Service, is very serious about what they do. You know, they're it's they're protecting national treasures. Um, for the people to appreciate and enjoy. And in the United States of America, we have an enormous spectrum of natural 
and historical treasures. Um, it's phenomenal, you know, from Gettysburg to Yellowstone uh, or Peace Pipe. Well, Peace Pipe National Monument isn't a national park, but it's a national monument. It's similar. Um, but it's just, you know, the Everglades or uh, the Lincoln Monument. I mean, it's, it's so many different things. It's nature and it's culture. And um, in some ways, it's a little bit about the, um, I mean, the Park Service was started at Yellowstone, yep. but also yep. at Acadia National Park. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one was established through wealth. Yes. That's Acadia National Park. You know, a lot of that land was donated by, uh, well, people of money. Yeah. People of money. I want. Yeah. I want to say robber barons, but I don't want to insult anybody either. You know. <laughs> well, these, um, hold, hold that thought because it's you know it's when we're discussing history. Um, I mean, you may or may not know. I I tend towards the moderate. I'm a moderate type of person. I don't really. I don't like any political extremes, left or right. So that's my bias. So you have to have to deal with that. So, but part, but part of that is Robert Barron's, these are terms that historians invent, right? Usually with, um, right, they, they invent because they have a certain agenda or they, you know, and so you want to emphasize the fact that the Carnegie and Mellons that they, that they, um, well, the Rockefellers, I mean, they were, they, they were railroads. They, but I, it makes me think of Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand. So like, okay. you know, it's a, we could go, that's a whole rabbit hole. <laughs> we could fall, fall into, right. um, what is it? But let me bring it. Let me bring it back, Mitch. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that the 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 journey is kind of um, the point. I don't. I don't mean to cut us off because oh, yeah. that is a, a conversation that's very interesting. Well, it, it's it's important. If I may, so it's important, and you know, only in so far as I think institutions are important, right? And so, if a natural conservancy is created, right, you have to figure out well how was it created. And so I guess all, all I mean to say is that you may have to look at people in different ways. You may have to say, well, this this public figure did some good, this public figure then did some bad, and you know, evaluate it on you know on its right. On, that's all I mean. It's like right. Yeah, well, yeah. and and you just heard that like there was a, a peak in Yellowstone that was just renamed First Nations Peak as opposed to uh, named after a general who massacred Indigenous people. Yep. You know, there's all there's so much history there, and it's so rich. And so, like, as a representative of the federal government, you can't take sides. You have to be very even-handed. Right. And they're very specific about their training of how you speak and what you speak about. Right. But they're also very good at training you in, in in speaking, in the art of speaking. Because as an interpretive ranger, I was speaking to visitors. Right. And I it was my job to inform them of what we were going to learn yeah. and show them that were in the in the natural environment and mm-hmm. then kind of explain what we had learned so that they can really take it away. I mean, there's so much there. How do you convey that in, yeah. you know, a one-hour tree identification walk? <laughs> it's sort of difficult, right, in one hour, right? But that's your job. You have to do that. Yeah. You have to do, well, I guess you have to do the hits, right? You have to do the, what, these are the most yeah. important, important things. That's the greatest hits. Yeah, I mean, I did shoreline walks, I did mountain hikes, I did, yeah. you know, evening uh, beaver observation, and, um, you know, if, if you're at a historical site, you might be doing reenactments or, you know, talking about history. Um, but I was really glad to be in the natural world, and I was interested, I always learned about, more about the place I was, and there was always an opportunity to delve deeper, because you had time to learn and research as part of the work. Mm-hmm. Um, because it made you a better park ranger. Yeah. And um, I guess and we... I love the. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I just love the hat. The you know the there was formal wear and then there was informal wear. So if you're like hiking up a mountain, you could wear a National Park Service baseball cap. But if oh. you were walking on a show, if you were doing one of the greatest hits, you had to wear your formal wear, which was you know wool blacks and a straw brimmed hat. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Is that like a uniform <laughs> for the job, or is that? Huh. Yeah. Yep. Huh? Mm-hmm. I don't know anything about that until now, so I'm learning that. Yeah, I didn't know. It's fascinating. I don't. I mean, yeah, it's a. It, it makes me think. Of, you know, as you as you very well know from your own life experience. Um, wouldn't you say a lot, uh, some things in life are connected to the government in one way or another, right? Government is, some, I guess, important, right? I mean, you 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 yeah. park ranger. Um, what would you say? Uh, um. 
uh, well, of course, there are some people that feel the government is, is kind of an accessory or just only a nuisance, right? And mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. a very ignorant way of looking at it. Um, what, what would you say to, to, to answer to those people who don't, don't see the value of the, the importance of government, not, not to get out of a soapbox, but um, it, has, it has place in reality, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I would say is, what do you think of the interstate system? Mm-hmm. Do you drive on the highways? Mm-hmm. You know, do you do you cross state lines? Do you benefit from different state policies? Do you benefit from federal? You know, there's it's it's complicated. I mean, it's a social structure, and right. there are many ways in which our society is failing, and there's many ways in which the the government has failed us. But there's so many ways that it supports us and and mm-hmm. uh, facilitates what we do as human beings too. I mean. We uh, oh. we live within social contracts, and right. we're allowed an enormous amount of freedom as Americans, way more than Other. many people around the world. Yeah. And I think that uh, that level of peace that we have, and that that agreement that people can pursue their own dreams and live their lives um, with with the freedom, which is an agreement to certain rules and freedom from other rules. That's uh, I think it's really important. I mean, one of the reasons why I love having you on this show is that you're one of the f- precious few artists I feel, if I can express this in my own language, it may not be your language, but um, who finds a balance between activism and aesthetics. And I think that that's, again, it seems to me that's one of your projects, right? One of your themes is trying to find a work to, work the two together. Would you say that's true or a fair... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've, I come, you know, I'm a feminist, I'm an environmentalist, I'm an activist. I, uh, I'm also very interested in materials, you know, so like, um, as a feminist, what is, what's a teapot and what's the opposite of a teapot is like a gun or like, you know, you've got guns, you've got these really strong arms, but then you've got guns, which are these really strong arms. (laughs) There's so much play. I mean, I love language. There's so much richness in all of that. Um, Do you mind talking a little bit about your love of language? You certainly are really gifted and you know a lot about it. I mean, you're doing it now, but puns and things like that. Are you you, um, a person who does crosswords and and sort of in in likes? uh, No, I suck at crosswords. I mean, I... I do. I get so frustrated. Is because you're more a vi- visual person, or is that uh, maybe yeah. I'm not? Uh, <laughs> maybe I've just I'm not. I haven't spent that much time practicing doing crosswords. I've tried. I know they're good for your mind and all, but yeah. Um, I think language is so interesting. Um, I think. You know, crosswords are clever in a certain way with language, but I'm not very good at ans- at coming up with the right answers, which is why I wasn't a very good student at the University of Chicago. You know, some people are very good at coming up with the right answers, and I'm just more interested in the question. Well, yeah, it sounds like you want to create something. Yeah. That's what's important, right, is making something new, right? I mean, that's certainly more valuable to me than regurgitating an answer to something. Well, but what's most, new? Most of I think I'm not interested in what's new. I think I'm just more interested in paying attention to what is. Right. I mean, I take those as to be synonyms. I mean, for me, those are the same things, actually. Interesting. New and is? Yeah. It's cause, cause, <laughs> you know, no, because cause to me, the as you know, I think the quotidian is everything, right? Which is what is, right? And I, I think only through that are new things created, is, is what I would mm. think. I mean, mm-hmm. I think it might be a mistake to try to be new. You know, I think that's is an affectation, or if you push that too much, that could be right. I think that that would be not ideal, right? So I don't mean being new for the sake of innovation. I just mean creating something as opposed to destroying, or you know, or, or or trying to you know create a new day, which we have to do together, right? We have to make a new day. We have to get up. We have to right, right. quotidian, and and so that's kind of um. You t- talk. You should talk rather than I, but 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 but. Go ahead. Well, it's such a quotidian is such a great word. It, I think it's French. Mm-hmm. But it also, it's like quota. Mm-hmm. It makes me think of, I, I, you know, I oftentimes I have a dictionary in my kitchen. And whenever I have, whenever my daughter asks me a question about a word, I break out the dictionary because yeah. 
I might know what it means or I might just have an internal understanding of what it means, but I'm always so interested in the etymology of the word mm-hmm. and where it comes from and how it's used. And then you stumble across other words that are very interesting. And that kind of takes you, a, a, a boyfriend of mine talked about the dictionary safari and you would just kind of go on these journeys of learning words. And it's different than, you know, Googling and coming up with Merriam Webster Google, which I always find kind of unsatisfying. Um, well, you, met, you mentioned your daughter. When did you become uh, become a mom? When did that occur? And, and... I became a mom pretty late in life. I was forty two. Okay, that's a good year to do it. Yeah, it's the answer. What is it? What is what does Douglas Adams say about forty two? From the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's the answer to life, the universe, and everything, or something like that's that. A really good book, isn't it? <laughs> what, what, what Douglas Adams books have you liked? Or not to not to get too far, you, you mentioned them. But... Oh, you know, that's really it. Okay. Yeah. I I love science fiction. Um, I consider that to be kind of science fiction, but it's also like a parody science fiction, a little less my leaning, I guess. Can I ask you a kind of a related but weird question? Why do you think that none of the streaming TV networks, by which I mean, you know, Netflix, HBO, et cetera, has done a good streaming series based on Ursula Le Guin, like uh-huh. or like the Left uh-huh. Hand of Dark. Why is it nobody's done it because it's they never found a script good enough, or she didn't okay it, or what do you? And that, but that seems like an ideal. Uh, Doesn't it seem like an ideal. That's a good question. I mean, there, didn't didn't they do? Wasn't Whoopi Goldberg in a in an Ursula Le Guin movie like A Wrinkle in Time? That's Madeline Lingle. Different, different. Oh, that's Madeline Lingle, right? Who's a, who's a, who's a Sort of a radical Christian, actually. Wrinkle. Yeah, and that's a great right. wrinkle on top. Well, C.S. Lewis too. I mean. Oh yes, but I mean, but that, that, that seemed to be an ideal thing to do. Left Hand of Darkness and do about those two planets. That, that could make a great series. Is all I'm saying. I oh yeah. 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 Um, but I, I don't know. Go- I don't have an answer for why not. I mean, yeah. I would. I'm all for it. I, <laughs> who knows why not? I mean, you want to start talking movies like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I just so I sort of I sort of feel like um, so you became a mom. You did it at forty two, and I guess the obvious question for me is, of course, your work's changing because of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Inevitably. So, so, what are those changes aesthetically? Like, what kinds of things are you doing, or, or what is it making you? I don't know. What? Well, you tell me because it's you know it's. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, talk, now we're talking about your um, um, many, uh, multiple episodes, you know, talking about motherhood and art making. I did listen to um, your, uh, what is it, Fantastic Friday? Oh, Alex Carr. No. Mm-hmm. Did you like Alex Carr? Wasn't it a great show? Love show. Yes, it really was. I loved it. And I loved hearing her daughter on, and I loved hearing her about how she was working and making around that. And I think that, um, you know, what I was doing before, I was always, I think you would agree, Mitch, that I was kind of a macho person or I had a little bit of machismo about me. Maybe it was the arrogance. I don't know, but there was something very that's strong. A, that's a very, that's a very um, sensitive question because we dated, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I do have my own feelings about things, but I, I have, overall, I have great fondness and, very, and feeling of love and a great, great affection about those years. And so I don't, I, you know, that's, that's, I mean, maybe that's too simplistic, but. Um, well, I don't, I mean, I don't, I, I, but, I don't yeah. want to make you feel uncomfortable. And it was well, at a I'm time not, before, I mean, gender bending wasn't really an issue. Like there was a little right. bit of uh, discussion about trans and, but there was right. the whole non-binary terminology didn't exist then. And, you know, I definitely identify as she, her, I mean, I would in some ways, even sometimes, especially as a mother, call myself it, because sometimes oh, you're just like a piece of furniture. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? <laughs> get, to get more precise, I mean, this macho quality in you, I mean, I do, I mean, maybe in terms of what, you know, what what I would would like or not like in a woman, it's, you know, it's a, it's a very, of course, a very sensitive issue. And, and um, but I never, I always, I never saw, I mean, I saw that part of you. But I, but I always saw it as a part of you, not all of you. It was just, an, it was like a yeah, like exactly. 
and you were to me very much very much female you know in a way that's as a, yeah. and all that and and I yeah. I didn't really um the only thing about you that did annoy me was was your car and all the lumber and the wood and that's all <laughs> you know the nails though that was the one thing that, that you know but hey, is that what you mean by macho that you got a lot of a equipment <laughs> I wish I had a pickup truck Mitch yeah. would that have bothered you even more <laughs> um I wouldn't have liked that no yeah <laughs> But but it's more like, I mean, I think in some ways it's a defense mechanism as a woman in society, yeah. as a small woman in society. You know, I'm always oh. treated diminutive, diminutively. Oh. So the bravado or that strength, you know, is like a way of kind of presenting and being strong and being armored and, yeah. you know, going out there and fighting kind of, you know, Jean d'Arc uh, as opposed to, you know. On a banana. So, so in, in a way, in that sense, I'm all for the pickup truck. <laughs> I mean, if it's, if it's that, that kind of project, yeah. Do you want to talk more? About yeah. Or what, what is? Yeah. So, that, so, yeah. so here's an example in my artwork. I was doing at one point. Um, I uh, I know people who own guns. Um, I've shot guns. I'm not a gun owner. I'm not. Uh, and you know, I'm a. I'm, I don't. I'm against gun violence, uh, but, oh, but guns, oh, it's horrible. It's, um, and, you know, I was... Not only is it awful, but as we record this particular episode, that's the, one of the major issues of our day. Wouldn't you say that's kind of... that's Absolutely. That's a, well, it's, it, what's interesting is how quickly, uh, how quickly uh, Congress is acting on gun violence uh, and how um, slowly it's been acting on uh, abortion rights or reproductive rights. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, now we're getting into the highly politicized and I don't really, I don't, I, I like having conversations. I don't like turning people off with politics. That's right. Um, I'm interested in the nuances and I like having, I mean, this is not about you, Mitch, you and I, we can always talk about things, but, sure. um, I feel like what's interesting about difference is when you can talk about it and listen, mm-hmm. even without agreeing, um, you know, civilly. Um, so, so the point is that. In, in the early 2000s, I did tracings of many different kinds of guns, and I collaged them into artwork uh, with wallpaper of, like, mannequin legs or teapots, things like that, because I was trying to figure out male-female. Okay. What is male? What is female? What is masculine? What is feminine? Like, what are these kind of uh, dichotomies? So can, I, can I ask you a, a kind of a, 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 a cold that thought on that point? Um, are you— yeah. Would you say that you're like me? You're sort of a partial essentialist or a half essentialist, or no? I, um, By which I mean, you're, clearly you're not a complete constructivist. It's not all artificial and convention, right? There's some deep. There is something to being male and female, right? Whatever, right? Or no? Well, I, I ask myself that question all the time. Oh, interesting. I can't. I don't feel comfortable with any particular label in that respect, um, right? Because. What I appreciate about a lot of the dialogue about gender now is the acceptance of fluidity. Like there, in many other cultures, you can be a feminine man. Yeah. You can be a masculine woman. You, there's, there's, there's a possibility for many other ways. It's just not just like boy, girl. Right, right. Um, and I, I'm interested in understanding the nuances and the complexities that make us human. I think we agree. I think we're very similar in that respect. Yeah, well, it's, it's even more interesting because now you're you're studying the history of the gun and revolvers, and you were trying. So, what what did you? Is it too too much to get into what conclusions you came to, or what you discovered, or that- well, I can't say that there were any conclusions. It's still pretty open ended, but I would say that when I became a parent, wow. uh, I painted all the guns out. Like the first thing I did when I got back into my studio is I went back into a series of work mm-hmm. that had guns in them and I painted them out and I retitled them. I painted the guns out Okay. because I did not even, I did not want an image of a gun in my artwork Perhaps. around my child. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I'm actually involved in a project now. Like if you go into my basement, there, my, I've had a lot of studios and right now my, my warehouse is in my basement. And if you go down there, you'll see like the tips of some uh, rifles, Mm-hmm. Uh, collages, you know, paper collages, and the tips of some legs sticking up on an old collage, and um, and I'm really interested to take a lot of that work and reconstitute it 
uh, into something else. So like it has that history. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious what will happen to it right. um, as it morphs into a new um, assemblage. A new life, I guess, or a new, a new. Life. Yeah, right. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I actually like the idea that someone, you know, you're a mom, and now you're gonna you're gonna have certain kinds of artwork. That's fantastic. But you, you just say, "I'm gonna do this and transform it." Uh, yeah, that's how I work. I mean, I'm so I'm so sort of responsive to what's happening around me, mm -hmm. politically, personally, environmentally. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, it all that's why, in. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said you're one of the worldly, well, the world is in. I, mm. I, t I tend to always prefer art that takes into account the world. I don't like, again, I might, again, not, I do love abstract expressionism. I do love some works of abstraction. Having said that, I do tend to prefer art that acknowledges the world and, and brings in the world and doesn't, you know, that doesn't, you know, put a deadbolt you know, door to the world and say no world. To meaning, right? Yeah. Like, right. But I, of course, sort of anti-modernist in a way. <laughs> well, I, I consider myself a post-modernist, but, but when I, which is probably similar to what I'm saying, but what all I'm saying is, um, I use the world, the word world in a very particular way though, mm. because world doesn't necessarily mean earthly or material only. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm. it involves, but it, uh, yeah. It involves spirituality, it involves emotion, it involves experience, it involves history, it involves the world. So I mean the world in right. the largest sense. Right. And I do, I do think that the artwork that's not as, I should say, is interesting to me is artwork that doesn't care about that or closes its eyes to that or, you know, or doesn't, you know, if, if that makes sense. So. Mm hmm mm hmm Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we're similar in that way. I mean, I, I, I resonate with that. It's, it's, I agree. Yeah. I mean, how can you, how can you separate anything out from anything else? And that's, you know, that's the greater ecology. There's a school up in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine called the um, College of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And you can graduate with a degree in human ecology. Yeah. Which kind of takes into account all of these things. You know, we think of ecology as being nature, but of course we're of nature. We're part of nature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, inescapably. So the things that we yeah. do, whether we're building rockets to Mars or, or not. Uh, sewing machines or, or fishing. planting crops or dams or fishing or swimming, or, you know, or bird watching, <laughs> we're of it. I mean, I, it's so amazing to me that you have in your house that singer sewing machine. Yeah, I know. I, I am amazed too. Can you, talk, can you talk about the last time you were in front of it? When was that and what were you doing or what? When Say that again? When were you last in front of that sewing machine? I don't think I've ever been in front of this sewing machine. Oh, okay. I think this came from, I mean, it's from my great aunt Betty, but right. I don't know if it was in my great aunt Rose's house, mm. who was her sister. Yeah. Uh, Rose Dane, Betty Shapiro. Um, or if it was in my parents' basement. I don't. Somewhere along the way, this black box that holds this sewing machine and a whole bunch of attachments and bobbins, the only thing it's missing is the bobbin case. But um, luckily, I live in a city where there's an amazing um, sewing machine repairman who can fix any sewing machine and he probably has just the thing I need for this antique. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I when I was waiting for you to call, I was nervous. And I decided to bring it up from the basement because I'm creating a studio in my basement for my next body of work. And uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to see if it works and plug it in and Got see what kind of condition it's in and all that. And so I had just pulled it out and started looking at it. So this is like the first time um, and I'm enchanted with it. Yep. And that's what you're doing right now. That's your, that's your next. Um, that's amazing. It's part of it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's black and enameled. It has gold writing on it. It has a medallion. It has, wow. it's just, it's phenomenal. It's, it's cast iron. Oh, wow. And oh, it's gorgeous. It's solid state. You know, that makes me think of, uh, you talk about the materials that go into this. So uh, is there anything you want to say about your love of, and, and, and um, both love and intelligence and knowledge about materials? That's a big topic, right? So <laughs> right so what I, mean, I don't know how much you know all, even good things come to an end like this episode but is there anything you want to add about the meaning of materials for you that you could you know because you're mentioning the cast iron and the gold or 
or mature uh, material culture yeah. or ingredients or whatever comes to your mind. It could be anything. And right. I, well, yeah, material culture. I mean, I have to say I'm sad to have this conversation end. You're going to have to call me again sometime. Yeah. Um, but uh, cast iron is something I discovered um, when I moved to Providence. Um, a friend of a fellow artist recommended that I take a workshop um, in upstate New York at Salem Artworks, um, led by a woman who runs the Foundry um, program at Alfred University. Mm-hmm. And um, I fell in love with it because there's a physicality. Like, we're actually casting iron. We're chopping up old radiators. We're wow. melting them in these uh, handmade furnaces. Yeah. And, you know, at night, we were pouring this molten hot metal into sand molds. I mean, there's so much there. Uh, in, in, in the mold making and pattern making and iron casting. But, you know, you think about cast iron, it builds bridges, it builds frying pans, it builds sewing machines, it, it builds skyscrapers. Um, it's such an industrial, early industrial material. I mean, of course, industrial materials have evolved into carbon fibers and all kinds of other composite yeah. things. But, um, I don't know. It's a moment of time. There's a transition. And when you think about textiles and the impermanence and delicacy and softness of textiles and the hardness of a cast iron sewing machine, even like there's a perfect dichotomy, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that I could explore visually or in words for a long time. There's so much, you know, there are a lot of artists that use the material meaning, um, Mm -hmm. As, as a way to bring in meaning and context into their work. And that's something that I incorporate too, not exclusively because I love color and form and texture as well, just in its purest form. Wow. That's exciting. So, um, Anna, I think, uh, I think you're, this is, this is, uh, I'm so thankful that you took the time to come on the show. Um, it's a pleasure. Before we conclude, is there anything you want to say about either your current work or about, the world or about anything that comes into your mind as we, as we say goodbye. Mm. Um, yes, I, there is one thing because we talked a little bit about how has my work changed um, mm. over time in the lin- in the linear, nonlinear way of <laughs> my being in this world as an artist and yeah. as a woman and as a mother. Um, and my most recent work is called love letters. It's out of, um, gallery that's um, unjuried, uncensored, and um, all ages, uh, called ASP20 in the reading room. And um, they are, it's rose petals um, and fake rose petals, and uh, I've typed on both of them, and I've uh, put them onto cardboard, and I've made bound books, and what, you know, you can see it on my website uh, and on my blog, but um it was a way of transforming the questioning of the dichotomies of feminine and masculine, soft and hard, uh, and all those things into something as big as love Mm. and love letters and presenting it in a way that was very subtle and subversive because all the fierceness that was in the work that had guns and Mm -hmm. cast iron is, and teapots and, you know, it's all in this work, but it's in a different way. And, um, it really asks the viewer to enter into it, um, and with, with some vulnerability, which I think right now, um, is really hard to do. We're all so hard and, hardened and defensive and insular and, and um, it's really important to come to each other with delicacy, but also understand that it's not simple. It's very complex. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's um, everything to me. And uh, I really, um, I'm happy that that love letters is your current project. I think that that seems to uh, be the best thing uh, an artist could be doing in 2022 or maybe the most appropriate. So thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you very much. It's It's wonderful to chat with you. Absolutely. We'll do it again. Okay. Bye for now. Mm -hmm. I don't like goodbyes, so I'll see you soon, folks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.